Okay, hello everyone. This is back-to-back cross-plane now, so we have again a cross-plane talk today, and it's some kind of a Stan Lee moment because we have Jared Watts here joining the stage. He's, uh, let me say, co-founding engineer of Upbound, so that's really, really awesome. So you get first the chance to ask any questions. So, and Stefano, of course, and we're talking about cross-plane composition functions, so welcome. Thank you, yes. Very excited to be here, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Stefano Borelli. I'm one of the solutions architects at Upbound. I've been there for three years, and just reintroducing Jared, he'll be co-presenting with me. He's one of the, the founding engineers of the Crossplane project, I think, made the first commit. First commit to the repo. All right. So we'll be talking about Crossplane composition functions, which are, for me, probably one of the most amazing things that have landed in Crossplane in the last year. So just a little bit. I know we've been talking about, there have been several talks, but just a really basic introduction. Uh, Crossplane is an extension of Kubernetes that allows you to manage anything. Um, and it's really ideal for folks who are building internal cloud platforms. Um, just the, all the um, abstractions that it provides, the architecture of it, it's a very strong fu fundamental building block. Um, and really what I want to talk about too is the last 12 months of the Crossplane project, because we've had incredible growth and maturity in the technology. Um, the first thing that we saw coming um, last fall was massive provider improvements, and these allow us to scale to tens of thousands of managed resources. So this was a big breakthrough for a, large, a lot of our largest users. Um, the next one, uh, this came out from a lot of talking to cross-plane users and customers of Upbound. Uh, we invested a lot in developer experience. And I know Jared's been very involved in that, making sure the developer experience. So the cross-plane CLI has gotten a lot of new features, everything from top functionality to tracing to being able to render compositions in advance. Um, so the CLI has really improved. Um, the signature feature of 114 has been cross-plane functions, which we're going to talk about today, and it really changed cross-plane um, almost to like a 2.0. Um, it's really uh, a major development in the platform, and it's really, we've seen, among the people who we work with in Upbound, we've seen almost everyone move to functions uh, within a few months. So it's been extraordinarily successful. And the last one, something that Jared is leading, um, we are a candidate for graduation in the CNF, BNCF. Um, so we have a very strong case for that, and I think we're just waiting for the vote. Yeah. <laughs> one simple step, the TOC voting. <laughs> All right. So let's get in it. We're just going to do a couple of concepts of cross-plane. I'm going to talk for 15 minutes, and then Jared will talk. Uh, the first one is a managed resource. Um, a managed resource is a fundamental building block of cross-plane. What it is is we take an object that's outside the Kubernetes cluster and we create almost something like a digital twin of it um, on the Kubernetes, right? And a managed resource is a high fidelity representation of the remote object, right? So in the case of an S3 bucket, um, the CRD, we use CRDs a lot within cross-plane, um, is basically a one-to-one -one mapping of the remote API. Right, so this is the fundamental concept of cross-plane. Manage resources, map one-to-one -to, -one to some object that you're managing outside the Kubernetes cluster. The second big concept is this is the controllers, like we talked about CRDs. These are the APIs that Kubernetes provides. Uh, providers are how we do things, and the way providers work is that um, the Kubernetes API server we leverage very heavily here. Um, so your clients that are coming in to consume your platform go through the API, so all the things you have in terms of like controls, authorization, and things like that, um, those are managed by Kubernetes, so you have one platform API you expose. The second thing is that the controllers, um, they watch, right? So the way Kubernetes works is it handles a lot of the things like creates, updates, and deletes. Um, so your controller, when it comes up, it just says, I am gonna manage all the S3 buckets, right? And it watches, and then when someone comes and applies a new bucket, um, it gets notified on its watch, and it'll go talk to the AWS API and create it. So these are the two fundamental concepts, um, CRDs that map one-to-one -to, -one to external objects and providers that will reconcile, like the Terminator, to the end of time. <laughs> like they will continually try to get to that desired state that you asked for. And a real quick demo of this, and um, I could do, I have a bucket here. And you can see, um, I created this in advance because the Wi-Fi could be kind of, um, a little unsteady. So what you see here is that um, when you create an object in Crossplane, um, it's a full Kubernetes object, right? So we have things like conditions. So like you're not running a shell script and examining the output. Um, every single managed resource has its own status and conditions and events. 
Um, so you can see here we have transition times, and um, we actually have a lot of really good metric systems where you, we, uh, we have a project called Xmetrics um, where you could actually expose all this information to Prometheus. So you could have across all your clusters um, the amount of time it takes resources to get ready, the state of all your resources, right? So it's incredibly powerful that when we integrate this with things like Prometheus. Um, you can see here we have two things. We have um, an at provider. This is what comes back from the cloud provider. Um, and this is everything that when you provision something, it's gonna, you know, in this case, we're gonna have a bucket. Um, and then the four provider is what we send. And we have things like annotations, labels, GVK, all the common things with Kubernetes, right? So this is what a managed resource looks like. Um, so the next thing is, um, and this is good because I'm speaking to another speaker here who is also Italian, and he was talking about he's also going to use a food analogy, so I think. <laughs> um, we want to talk about what do we do, because you've seen we want to build complex infrastructure at scale. Like we want to manage tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of objects, right? And we want to provide complex things to our customers um, and have a simple API to that that we give to them, but we want to have the freedom to be able to create complex things in the back. Like that they ask for a database and they just say, I want a 30 gig database, but in the back we're creating network security rules, default users, passwords, and things like that. So the best way to think about cross-plane compositions, which is what we use to make more complex infrastructure, is like a restaurant, right? Your menu, you as a platform engineer is what you offer up to your end users, right? So this is what we're gonna talk about. How do you create? you know, the meals that you're making, right? You have a recipe, and then you have different ingredients, and then what gets produced out of that is a meal, right? And then someone comes to your restaurant, they order it, um, and that's what happens. So in cross-plane terminology, this is what we have. Um, so you're gonna see composite resource definition in XRD. Anytime you see an X, that's a cross-plane composition concept. Um, so the XRD, the composite resource definition, is your menu. Right, those are the CRDs that you create. You just saw the talk that Carlos had right before us. He's creating a dev cluster or whatever for his tenants. You create that yourself, you apply it to the cluster, and you can create anything. You can use uh, open API. There have been some talks about Cell, so I've been looking at using Cell also for validation. So there, you could use Caverno, right? Like, so your clients, you could validate it, and it's all in YAML, so it's low code. The next thing is the composition, which we're gonna talk about the functions. The compositions are what actually put all those resources together. And then the com combination of this creates a composite resource, right? So when your user comes in and makes a claim, they're gonna get attached to that composite resource, right? All the things they ask for that get mapped through, you, and, you know, Carlos was showing his patches, um, that actually creates a composite resource, all right? So I hope this is explainable because a lot of these composite, composition, composite, the wording is so similar to each other, this is often gets confusing for people, but I want you to think in terms of um, the interface, the recipe, and the result of it. So, how do compositions create desired state? So a user asks for something, it goes through the composition, it comes out, we create all the resources, and then those resources are provisioned, they go back, persisted back to SCD, and then the providers have watches and they create it. Right, so this is part of Crossplane's architecture too. You start seeing isolation of responsibility, right? Providers are only responsible for doing provisioning, um, and the composition is actually combining the resources. Um, so, we use functions, right? So this is the big change that came in 114. We used to have uh, the patch and transform engine, which is still in, the, in there, but functions are a really big breakthrough. Um, so if you've used to like GitHub Actions or any other CI systems that are defined in YAML and they have like a pipeline, this is very similar. So this is what we do. Um, your user claim is gonna come in. It's gonna go through a function composition pipeline. At the end of it, there's gonna be a series of YAML manifests that get provisioned and those go out to the providers. All right, so functions, one of the cool things about functions that really makes them powerful is they're extremely lightweight. Like think about like lambdas for infrastructure. Um, so lambda, so they're very similar to Unix pipes. So in here I have a JSON manifest, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pipe it through JQ, right? Like with JQ you can actually add fields to JSON and at the end of it we come out with something. So I'm gonna, just gonna add a label to something, right? And this is the basic way that functions work, right? Like you take the previous step of the function, you mutate it or add new fields to it, and then you send it on to the next level of the function. And at the end of the pipeline, whatever's constructed goes out to the providers, right? So functions, and if you're using one of our SDKs, uh, functions, a lot of the internal workings of gRPC and all that stuff is hidden from you. All you need to know is, can I manipulate a map? Um, and I have another example of this. Let me see here. 
I have this little pipeline.sh here, and what you see here is I'm just doing two JQs in a row, right? Like I'm saying I'm adding a label and an annotation. This is so this would almost be like running two functions in a row, right? Like you take the output from one and you put it into the next one. Um, and if I did something like you know pipeline sh in basic, here you see we'll add a label and an annotation, right? So this basically this is the foundation of how functions work. Obviously we have a little more complexity to it, but if you can do this. Um, if you could create YAML in this way, or JSON, you could write a composition function. All right. Um, I'm just going to leave this slide here just because one of the really things, nice things about functions is you could either write it yourself in Go, um, or you could use built-in ones like for KCL or Q or Go templating. Um, there's a bunch of different languages you could write them in. Um, so you have a, uh, a vast swath of uh, complexity that you can work with. All right, um, just something really simple here. This is an example of a Go one, and a lot of Go functions are small, but what I want to point out here is if you know anything about Go, um, this gets invoked by the SDK, and there's only two things you have to do. In, you get a run function request, right? That's your, that's your structure that comes in, and you return a run function response. So this is the internal workings of a function, right? So as long as you do that, this is a very small one. You're just returning it at the end. You take the structure in, you modify it, and you pass it out the next, to the next step of the function. That's it. So most Go functions are like a single code block, and they're usually 100, 200 lines of code at most. Um, there's Go templating. Like if you ever used Helm, this is like 95% the same. You could just like have Helm templates that are rendering things with loops and conditionals. Um, there's KCL, which I'm about to demo, right? So KCL is a new kind of configuration programming language that is um, in the CNCF right now. And you can see here what we're doing is we're creating VPCs and gateways. Um, so yeah, let's do that. So I am going to demo KCL, like using KCL on a composition function. And um, yeah, the repo's here, and obviously we'll publish all the slides. Um, so what I want to show here is I have a KCL um, composition. If you saw before, you know, Carlos was showing a little bit, it, it looked a little different. Um, so what we have here is we have um, a function pipeline, and the first step is to render with KCL. And what we're going to do is we have our input, and you can see here we just have the programming language in there. So here we're going to get some fields, and we're going to read the parameters that come in from the user claim. Um, and then what we're going to do is, based on the count, we're going to loop through and create VPCs, right? And the same thing for uh, a API gateways. And we're doing some matching here because the way Crossplane internally can match uh, gateways to VPCs, we could do dynamic selectors like you can with um, you know, other Kubernetes resources. And at the end of that, we're just going to get the VPCs plus gateways and, and just send it back onto the next of uh, the function. And the next function we have is something called auto-ready, which just makes sure that all the resources are working. Um, so what I could do here is I can actually, um, if we're looking at this, this is uh, one of our new tools that we have. is called Crossplane Beta Trace, right? So what I'm doing here is on the command line, I'm just watching this. And I created this in advance, but we have a gateway, and you can see how it's structured. And what I could do is I can come here and change like the XR with gateway, and I can make it, say, 4. What if I do? XR with gateway. Right, so we just configured immediately there, and then the function should pick it up, and it's going to start rendering all the extra gateways. Right, so when we talk about multi-tenancy or building up lots of things, so the functions work automatically. So that is a really brief introduction. So obviously, um, there's Q that Elastic is developing. We have a Q function too that we can use, and um, there's someone at this conference who's working on a pickle function, the, uh, Apple's new configuration language. So we're very excited about that. So the ecosystem is really growing very fast. Um, this makes Crossplane incredibly powerful. Um, and you can see these are all available now, Sweet. right? We can track it in real time, every event. So you're not like waiting 20 minutes for a state file. Every resource is provisioned individually. So that is the end of mine, and I will pass it on to Jared. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Let me get plugged in here real quick. All right. Hopefully, it'll remember that I told it to mirror my display. Oh, yes, it did. It seemed to. All right. <coughs> cool. All right. So Stephen was showing everybody. All right. Uh, what crossplane is, what compositions are, how functions work, etc. So now we're going to go into the like steps of actually how to build your own function. I think this talk is called something like crossplane functions step by step. Steps. Let's get to steps. So uh, I think a big takeaway here is that there are a bunch of new like, tooling uh, available. 
within the Crossplane ecosystem to basically help you get your platform built uh, and, and do it quickly, right? And so um, it's just going through one, one to five here. We'll walk through them all for real. We'll basically start by using the tooling to scaffold out or initialize a new function project. And then number two, that's the part where it's like unique to your needs, your organization, your platform. You know, Carlos is showing us his platform. He built something unique to his needs there. That's where you use your language and your choice, uh, your tools of choice to uh, write the code that's unique to your organization. And then that's you know, the, the part that's specific to you. After that, then, you use more of the tooling to go in a local de de development iteration loop you know, on your laptop. Uh, be you know testing it, you know seeing there's bugs, fixing things, keep going, right? So uh, then once you feel like you've got it working on your local laptop, you can use the tooling to go ahead package it up, push it out to a registry. A crossplane package is really just a you know OCI compliant image, so nothing too fancy there. And then install it into the control plane. Um, that last one's maybe maybe misleading because like it's re really all that tooling is doing is uh, applying a, a, a function manifest to your cluster. Everyone just does that through GitOps, so you probably don't use the tooling for that one. All right, but let's get into the actual demo here. So we're in the same repo that, uh, that Steven had us in, and let's go ahead and hop over to that here. And so I'm gonna copy and paste some stuff um, and, and talk about it, so for speed here. So basically what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna go ahead and um, you know, initialize this new repo here. I'm going to say I want to write a Go function. So go from the, the, the template for Go functions and put it into this directory for me. Cool. Looks like there's some init script in that repo for me, too. I'm not just going to run it. I'm going to look at it first. What does it do? Oh, cool. It looks like it just like, updates the go.mod go and my function stuff to the imports, whatever, to customize it from the function name I've granted. Yeah, so I'll run that. That sounds good, yes. Cool. So now we have a function. Uh, set up basically. So let's go ahead and um, in another tab, let's run the function. Uh, so it's actually up and running and can listen to requests and send us back responses. And then in this other tab here, uh, let's actually look at this thing. Um, so was it XFN demo? I think it was. So yeah, let's let's lo uh, load it up here. Visual Studio Code. Uh, so three p main things to look at here, real quick. So we've got a main.go for this program. It's basically going to start up a function server that's going to be sitting there and listening to requests and sending back the responses from our custom code. Uh, we've got the function body here, which Stephen kind of showed a slide on there, right? Where this is the, the unique logic in our function is inside here right now. This is the templated one. It works, but it doesn't do anything particularly interesting yet. It basically reads in the uh, request from, you know, coming from the user, to, uh, you know, cross plane sending it to us here. It's you know, reading in that input there, and then it's going ahead and logging something out and returning a response that everything was okay. Then the last important thing to look at is that you know, we need a composition to pull all of this together, right? So here's a simple composition that basically has a function pipeline that has one step of run our function, right? This is the one we're running right now. So run the function in this composition, get the in, uh, and send this input to it that I have here, and then get the result back cross-plane. So we are going to do this all locally uh, because um, you know, we want to get this you know, in a tight development loop, right? We want to do this on our laptop, make sure that everything's working. So let's just copy this real quick, and let's run, let's go to CD example, I think. Now let's run this render function here. And what this is doing, right, is it's using the Crossplane tooling to go send a request from Crossplane to our function and get the result back. Uh, nothing particularly interesting yet, right? We said, hello world, okay, cool, that's nice. But uh, let's start modifying it, right? Let's, we are a developer, we're gonna start changing things here. So as a platform engineer, I'm taking this composition and I'm going to say, okay, I'm gonna pass a different input into this function here. So like uh, Paris Rejects, hello Paris Rejects. Oh, I misspelled that. I added that to my user dictionary too, so it doesn't correct me anymore on, on that. Uh, okay, cool. So then we should be able to run it again. And what we should see this time is that you know, we've changed the composition, we've changed the input that's going into the function, and the function returns something back different, right? Hello, Paris Rejects. Still not that interesting yet, right? Because we're just modifying the composition itself. We haven't actually changed any of the code, so it's still not really doing much interesting stuff. So I'm not gonna type this code in front of everybody. That would definitely take way too long. It'd be too error prone. So in our little uh, demo here, I'm just gonna quickly grab this code uh, throw it there, and then I'm also going to basically, oh, no, I want to do a go mod tidy to, because I've got some new imports, and then I want to go ahead and essentially, um, 
yeah, run the function again. Okay, so the function's up and running with our new code. What is this new code that we have here? Okay, now this is gonna do something sort of interesting. So here in Crossplane, we're using Go code to, to like, co dynamically compose resources of real infrastructure in the cloud. We're gonna do that with Go code using our tooling, you know, doing everything that, you know, linting and compiling and verification and unit tests and all that sort of stuff, right? Now we can write logic and code that does real things in the real world with infrastructure. Uh, so basically what this does is this creates an S3 bucket uh, programmatically with this Go code. It says like what region it should be in, et cetera, and then it go ahead and returns that back to Crossplane saying, hey, desired, uh, the desired resources here, uh, I want there to be this bucket in Crossplane. This is desired now. Please go make that happen in the real world. So that's essentially what this code does here is it cre programmatically creates an S3 bucket and then sends it back to saying, Crossplane, please make this happen in the real world. So once again, we can use our tooling with that new function running, we can use our tooling, and instead of returning back a hello Paris rejects or hello world, it's now returning useful stuff. It's returning this actual S3 bucket. Um, cool, that looks nice, but I mean, is this right? Like, I don't know, it's running on my laptop right now. It's like, this, it could be totally wrong, right? So more developer tooling in Crossplane to build your platform successfully and quickly is, let's grab this real quick, and a little extra file here. Uh, yeah, let's drop it right here. So basically in this file here, I'm telling Crossplane where to find the schemas for all these resources. You know, uh, S3 bucket is in the uh, S3 provider for Crossplane. Um, so I'm just kind of telling it where the schemas live. And then now we can do some enhanced development flow where, uh, let's see, let's grab this one here. So basically now we're running that same render again. We're running render, uh, send, you know, send the user input to my function, execute the function, return it back. Now, do something with that output. So we're gonna pipe that output into the crossplane validate command. And so that will be like, okay, let me look at this thing. Uh, you've got an S3 bucket. Yeah, and that's compliant with all the schema. There's no crazy fields, so nothing's wrong, indented wrong or whatever. This is a valid bucket. So you know, we've taken this whole workflow here and you know, on our developer laptop, kind of started building a platform. Uh, you know, didn't have to do anything in the real world. We got some validation that it's actually correct also. Um, you know, we did it all with, uh, with code. So one last quick thing to show is that if you're not a Go person, um, you know, that's totally reasonable. Uh, you also have a SDK and, you know, function implementation in Python as well. So uh, Python demo, let's just open up Visual Studio Code in there. Um, so yeah, if you're a Python person, which I'm not, uh, you know, you would see here that you've got like the main entry point for the Python function. Uh, it's going to go ahead and start up a function runner, function uh, server as well. And then here's your main entry point. No, I don't want Python extensions. I don't need to do Python. Uh, so then, you know, here is the same similar thing that we saw in the Go function. It's a Python function to compose, you know, write your own unique logic for your platform, compose resources together, do that in Python, use your Python tooling, whatever that is, and you can be happy with Python now too. All right, that was super, super quick of going through all the code and all the steps there. Uh, so it's really, really important to, I think, reiterate these key, key, key takeaways, I think, from, um, from what functions do in Crossplane. All right, two super important things. So one, uh, with functions now in Crossplane, uh, instead of the regular patch and transform uh, logic that, uh, that Carlos was showing us in the last talk, so Crossplane is way more powerful now and way more flexible than it ever was before. Um, you can literally do things that were impossible for, before in Crossplane. There's a you know, long-standing request to, hey, Crossplane, can we you know, add this extra logic to your patch and transform composition, add this, add this. Instead of bolting that all on together, we've kind of given you the opportunity to use you know, your language, your tools of choice, do it you know, exactly how you want to. And then we've seen the functions ecosystem like, really start taking off now. So there is, there's a function for almost a lot of things now. Um, the other super important key point here, though, is that uh, before functions, you had to take your manifests, you know, I want to create an S3 bucket, an RDS database, this, that, and the other. Uh, you had to take all those and then to test them, uh, go apply them to a real live cluster and like create real resources in the real world and see if they worked. Um, not particularly effective or efficient or, you know, a lot of things that that's not good for. So now, as we saw here, I didn't touch the cloud. I didn't touch the real world at all. I just used, you know, on my laptop, being able to do all this local development stuff and rapidly iterate. Get this thing to correct, get this thing to production ready, and then you know, put it into the real world. Uh, so that is 
I think, a great accelerator for if you've like, worked with Crossplane in the past three, four years, you might have you know, had that pain point of, cool, I'm going to try to create an EKS cluster. 30 minutes later, it didn't work. All right, I'll change this one line in my composition. Try, yeah, you're laughing. You did it, I think. Uh, so it's way, way faster now, way, way better. So much, much more improvement. All right, lightning round. We've got a lot of functions that have been written now. Let's see some of the ones, like, what do they do? Here we go. First one, filtering with uh, common expression languages. So we see here we've got uh, you know, some patching and transforming stuff that's creating a DynamoDB table, S3 bucket. And then the second step in the function pipeline here is uh, being able to use uh, common expression language to filter out resources. So hey, let's not create that S3 bucket unless the, uh, you know, the spec for this, the user has said that they want to export to S3. So have a function for that, filter stuff out, conditionally create resources. Uh, cool, we can use Q now. Um, you know, so here's some Q script stuff to basically uh, dynamically build up and uh, you know, create IAM policy objects with you know, various configuration information flowing in. So if you're a Q person and you want to build your platform with Q, yeah, you can do stuff like that now also. Uh, here's the kind of interesting one, uh, resource sequencing. So typically in Kubernetes, the controller's eventual consistency is awesome. Try to create something, try to create another thing that depends on it. Uh, they'll figure this thems out themselves out as they're actively reconciling and driving towards eventual consistency. Not always the case. Sometimes if you create something that depends on another object, like if that, it, it might fail if it really needs that object to exist, uh, okay, get into a terminal failure state. If that happens, no worries, there's a function for that. You can go ahead and say, hey, there's this core, uh-oh, I advanced the slide. There's this core resource here, uh, and then there's these other resources that depend on it. Hey, second step in the pi pipeline, uh, you know, the sequence function. Go ahead and make sure that core resource is created before the second resource, and that core resource is created, is created before the third resource. Don't even try to create those resources until core is done. Another one, environment information. Uh, you all may be familiar with environment configs, uh, you know, being able to specify general information about the runtime environment that a uh, cross-plane control plane is going to be running in. There's a function now to you know, select, merge, pull all this together, and then pass it to subsequent steps in the function as well. Uh, so this is an example of that, you know, getting the environment configs, passing it to a Go template function. <coughs> Last one. This is from the community as well, uh, where you know, this kind of enables you to turn on and turn off re uh, resources that are inside your composition. Uh, but it's kind of elevating that up to the consumer's level of when the consumer is you know, creating an object that will invoke a composition that will compose resources together, they can have a little bit of control over which objects get created as well. Uh, so the, the point here is there's a lot of functions. The ecosystem is building a lot of them. Next school function, maybe it's one of yours. If you're building one, feel free to reach out and we can you know, collaborate on it together. That's awesome. But to do so, you know, get involved in the Crossplane project. So here's all our links, crossplane.io. We're on Slack heavily. Uh, and then final thing is if you are using Crossplane and we want to know about it, it definitely helps our graduation proposal, and that's all we got. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Stefano and Jared. Uh, any questions? I'm, yeah. Thanks for your talk. I have a very quick one. Can you go back to your demo and try to inject an error in the validation? Like when you validated the S3 bucket, for example. Uh, yeah. I know it's a tricky question, but I would love to see how you handle the error. Yeah, uh, I think so. There's maybe uh, maybe a couple ways to do that actually. Uh, so one really important point here, I think, is that because we're using our uh, language of choice and we have all the tooling like upfront before you even get to crossplane tooling, I can be like, okay, cool, let's try to do like foo, you know, some this string, I don't know, whatever. Uh, and like, oh, we've got a red squiggly line uh, because uh, foo is not a, a part of an S3 bucket. You can't do that. So you know, before we even get to crossplane validation tools to run against the schema, like you're already linking or importing against the you know Go modules for uh, S3 buckets and, and all the AWS GCP whatever um, objects. So in your environments, with your tools of your choice, you can get a, you know a native feeling experience about you're doing something wrong. Okay. I hope that answers the question because it's like you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. shift it all left, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it would have said like put US East five or something, a region that doesn't exist. Right, yeah, right, right, right. Or whatever. Yeah, you you could actually use Open API definitions and cell. Like if you have a if you have a manifest like a cell manifest, you could add it. You could validate against it in crossplane validate. That's nice. Thanks. Yeah. Really good question, man. All right, running out of time, maybe. Any questions? Thank you. Hello. 
Thank you for the talk. Uh, are functions going to replace the cross resource definition at some point? Because we could like do the composition directly in functions. I don't know if, if, if that makes sense, but. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I think a, a good way to think about functions is that it is definitely like the, the way forward of creating and defining your platform and composing resources together. Um, you know, you still will need to like define the abstraction that you're offering to your developers. So like the composite resource definition, that's not going away at all. Like that's like you know, defining the API, the shape of your API for your platform. Uh, but like the way that you want to compose things inside, you could still do things with the native patch and transform and the way you've always done things. Like you can do that because there's a function for that. Too, so it mimics the same experience and doesn't change it at all. Um, but then you have all this new world of code and scripts and functions to do stuff for you that wasn't available before. So it doesn't really re replace it as in it does, you can't do that stuff anymore. You can do more stuff now. OK, I have a question, Jared. To make a specific certain demography happy, when is the REST SDK coming? <laughs> Or is there a Rust SDK? Uh, <laughs> community contributions are definitely accepted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>